I have to say that, that this, this planning process that you have here is, is rare. Um, a lot of institutions, and, and because of the book, I've been talking to strategic planning groups uh, across the, the, the country, um, around the world, actually. Uh, and, and they always seem to start with, um, with some business book uh, that says that you have to, uh, that you have to reimagine who you are and find your, your, your core spirit. And, and you know, the, the, the trappings of, of, of strategic planning uh, are easy to come by. Um, the, the art of strategic planning is much more difficult. Uh, and so I'm really impressed to see the extent to which this campus has, um, has taken strategic planning um, seriously. Um, and and I, you know, I, I've thought about what it is that I can say um, that's, that's going to matter in this kind of environment. Um, and, and maybe the thing to do is to start this way. Um, Dartmouth is, is an island of excellence. Um, and just about any dimension that you want to choose, um, this is uh, an institution that, that, that most other private institutions uh, would aspire to be, to be like. And, and, and I think you all know your strengths. Um, you all know the, the kinds of students um, that attend, um, attend Dartmouth. But, but you live in, a, in this big ocean. Uh, you live in the system of higher education in the United States. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering to what extent the, the, um, uh, the experience of, of working and teaching and administering in an island of excellence carries over to help create a system of excellence. Uh, and, and that's kind of where I want to take our, our discussion uh, today. Uh, and let me let me begin by um, by saying I'm I'm exceedingly uncomfortable um, giving a lecture on on the future of higher education to my colleagues. Um, it, it's it's one thing to to write a book and go to a book club and and and, and read chapters from your book and uh, and give a one hour a one hour lecture. Uh, it's another thing um, to to sit in an auditorium like this with your colleagues and presume to tell you what's going on. Um, so I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to do that for, for a variety of reasons that I think will become clear. Well, let me not be coy. So, so, so one of the reasons uh, is, that, is that I intensely dislike the idea of a lecture. Um, I, I, I think, I think if, if you had to invent uh, a mode of learning that was least likely to induce learning, what you would do is get a group of people like this, 70 people in a room, um, and, and uh, for 50 minutes or 55 minutes, talk at them with some amount of passion, um, and do that three or four times a week. Uh, and then occasionally, let's say every six weeks or so, um, ask them, so what did you learn? five weeks ago, and then not tell them about what you thought of their answer for another two weeks. <laughs> and you repeat that. That's how college education looks to most of the world. And it, 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 it comes to us honestly. I mean, if you, if, if you look at the, at, the, um, uh, at the internal writings and, and memoirs of of places like um, uh, like the University of Paris in in the in the Middle Ages, when people were trying to figure out what universities were, that's kind of what they said. They said it, you know, it's up to the students to write fast enough uh, to be able to to keep up with us. Um, and so and so we've adopted, I think, the trappings of education um, uh, mainly because it's what we always did. It's, it, we, we could sort students. Um, this way, uh, there's an element of, uh, of stagecraft um, that, we, that we all like. Um, but it's, it's actually not something that's suitable to learn. And I'm going to talk about technology in a few, in a few minutes. But, but let, me, let me just say at the outset that, that I believe that for the first time, 
Um, there's, there's an understanding of how the brain actually learns, how the brain works during the learning process that can convince any of us that this kind of format that we're engaged in right now is really not a good idea. We know, for example, that in order, in order to learn, you have to transfer information from short-term memory to long-term memory, which means that in computer science terms, there's this buffer in the brain that holds information temporarily. And that's what has to be reinforced. Neurotransmitters have to be produced. Patterns have to be, uh, have to be made. Um, and, and, and that process has to be repeated until, until the, the ideas, the skills, the activities that you want impressed on long-term memory actually make it out of the buffer into long-term memory. And, and we know that there's a limit to what can be stored in short-term memory. Basically five concepts. I've already given you five concepts. We should stop now. <laughs> but we don't. We, we don't. We try to pack. Carolina just, just had a discussion about moving from, from quarter system to the semester system. And I, 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 I promised her that, that, that she would try to pack as much information into that semester as, as she could in two quarters. Um, because that's how you're trained to, to, to do it. Um, so this little digression I'm going to come back to. Um, but uh, let, me just, let me just say that um, this ocean that we're living in, the system of higher education, the thing that I would like islands of excellence like Dartmouth to affect, um, uh, is, is not a sustainable system. I don't know anyone who has seriously looked at American higher education that can come to the conclusion that what we're doing right now is financially, socially, morally, pedagogically sustainable. I, I, I live in a university system. Um, Georgia Tech is a public university. The university system of Georgia has 350,000 students, more or less. Uh, that number is growing. That number, number is growing dramatically. Um, and uh, a year ago, if I had given this talk, I could have said there are 36 universities in the University of Georgia system. Today there are 31. By this time next year, I expect that number to be 26. So here you have a growing market. You have a market in which in which there are probably in the state of Georgia 800,000 potential post-secondary students. These are, in addition to students that will go to technical schools, students that are going to be bound for one or more institutions in the university system, that are now going to be accommodated by 26 institutions. 30% reduction in the number of institutions. A lot of presidents go away, a lot of student centers um, go away. A lot of cost goes away, but, but you do still have this problem of what are we going to do with these students? And that, and, and that story is being replicated around the country. Every week I have a conversation with a president of a public university who is in exactly that situation. Aha, you say, well, this is, this is um, what private institutions are for. You know what? Private institutions are, are um, uh, unsustainable economically at a rate that far exceeds public institutions. Um, the, the, the rating agencies rate the financial viability of, of private, um, private universities. And every year, the number of institutions who are um, Financially unhealthy enough to be at the cusp of disappearing goes up. That number is about ready to come out for this, for this year. Uh, somewhere, somewhere in the neighborhood of 170 private institutions. 
As long as we're talking about finances and, and, um, uh, and, and rating institutions, I think one of the signposts for me of what's going on in higher education uh, is the January report that Moody's put out that rates higher education as a sector of the economy. Now, Moody's has always been kind of suspicious of higher education um, uh, and, and the finances of higher education. Uh, but in January, they rated the entire sector negative. That means, according to a major rating agency, you should never float another bond to a university, public or private. They'll never pay it back. And this has been going back and forth with Moody's for the last few years. Um, uh, at one time, they rated a portion of higher education negative, and then said, oh, you guys are OK. Uh, and, 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 now, uh, and now we're all these bad guys whose income to debt ratios are so awful um, that, that they would not recommend any of our, um, any of our bonds. So in addition to rating, what they did is looked under the covers. Uh, and the interesting thing to me about, about the Moody's report is not the negative rating, it's what they said about higher education. What they said about higher education is that without structural changes, institutions will disappear, they'll go out of business at an astounding rate. Now, no one knows what that rate is. But if a quarter of the institutions in the US, quarter of the somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 public and private universities in the US, if they all of a sudden disappear, the 1,000 of them disappear, it will have an impact on places like Dartmouth. Because something has to absorb those students. And that something is connected to uh, institutions, to bureaucracies, to government agencies, to the ways that we think about, think about how students um, um, approach a university, get a degree, get their education funded, that are interconnected. And that's kind of why it matters to Dartmouth. So I hate to start out on a bummer, but that's kind of where we are. So I'm, I'm a technologist, um, and, and I, I love, as, as Carol said during the, the, the intro, uh, I, I love the internet. Um, I've been involved in this stuff for my entire professional career, my entire anything career. Um, but I'm, I'm, also, I'm also one of the people that, that um, thinks that technology is not an answer for anything. I didn't say it's not an answer for everything. I don't think technology is an answer for anything. Why do I say that? Um, if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have a value proposition for your students, if you don't have an underlying reason for the strategy that you're, um, that you're undertaking, then bringing technology into the picture adds absolutely nothing. On the other hand, if you put technology in the center of your strategy, if you make it a necessity, then it adds nothing to your strategy. Uh, these lights here are a necessity for running a university. The water in the kitchen, the bathrooms, the water fountains. This is a necessity for running the university. They aren't the strategy. They give you absolutely no strategic advantage at all. If technology is really a necessity, it's going to be shared by everyone who tries to run a university. You can't differentiate yourself on the basis of having better technology. You have to have a better university. You have to have a better way of teaching. You have to have a better way of approaching students. And some of that will be enabled by technology. But the technology itself doesn't add much. So what is technology in my, in, 
in my, my view of, of, of where higher ed is going. So, so technology to me removes a bunch of restrictions. It removes a bunch of you can'ts from the way that we teach, the way that we, that we learn. I said I hated lectures, so what, what do I put in place of lectures? I put in place of lectures something that we know works better. Benjamin Bloom, 30 years ago, published a paper called The Two Sigma Problem. The Two Sigma Problem compared classrooms like this, the one that we're in now, the kind of interaction we're having there, with a learning style in which students are repeatedly presented with material and assessments until they demonstrate their mastery of the material, and then they go on to learn something else called the mastery, the mastery model. So Bloom's study, which he did with his students, was a meta study of, of maybe 100 uh, prior education research studies. And the conclusion was that if you move from this normal classroom to a mastery classroom, you essentially move everyone against standard measures of achievement a standard deviation. You move everyone to the 94th, 95th percentile. And furthermore, if you do it in such a way that you give individualized attention to the students, you move them another standard deviation. And this is a conclusion that, that applies uh, across geographic boundaries, across ability levels of students, across subject matter being taught. If you do things differently than we're doing them right now, in that particular way, you get an outcome that is measurably better. So this has been the dirty little secret in higher education for 30 years. Why don't we do this? It's enormously expensive. How do you do this? How do you have a single professor tracking everyone in class as they proceed at a different rate through the mastery of the material, let alone having individualized tutors for the 350,000 students in the University of Georgia system. It was why Bloom put it away. He says in the paper, it's not feasible for financial reasons to implement this kind of strategy. But it is now. And one of the things that we get out of technology is this you can't has been removed. Because we can have tutors that follow students as they progress at different rates through the material. Five concepts at a time. 15 minute lectures at a time. And we can give them maybe not individualized attention but individualized feedback, which it turns out, again, if you want to look at, look at the data, is all that really matters. Carl Wayman, um, uh, STEM teaching lab at the University of British Columbia, um, did a meta study of, of what matters to learning outcomes when you measure interaction, professor, student, interaction. And it turns out, that regardless of what you hear, your colleagues, university presidents, people who want to, who want to preserve what we loved and remember about, about the college classroom, say, um, the only thing that really matters is giving feedback to the students in a timely fashion, in a way that's individualized to what their needs are. The interaction component the face-to-face -face interaction component, which we think matters a lot, turns out when you look across all the data, doesn't matter hardly at all. So this brings up another theme that I have, which is that it doesn't matter how we feel about this. Um, we have a raging debate going on at Georgia Tech over massive open online Courses. And I know you had my friend Daphne Kohler here. Daphne gave you a great, um, uh, a great overview of what a MOOC is. I don't have to do that. 
But we decided at Georgia Tech to jump into the idea of a MOOC because we thought that it would transform the classroom experience. We knew that people around the world would be, would be taking our courses. And we knew that most of them wouldn't be paying anything for it. But we did it because we thought that we could get around the Benjamin Bloom Two Sigma problem by using the technology in a clever way. And we don't have results to report yet, but we've, we've, we've got 20 classes that we've offered. We've got another 20 classes that we'll offer uh, next year, probably the most of any university in, in Coursera. Uh, and we're starting to see not what happens to this big mass of students that are out there, the 300 and 375,000 Coursera students that are signed up for Georgia Tech courses. We don't know much about them yet, but we know about our own students. And we know about our own faculty. And we know that, that the faculty that have participated in the, in the production of MOOCs transform the, the way that they teach class. And they transform the way that they interact with students. And we know this because the students tell us this. Whether you call it a flipped classroom or a wraparound MOOC uh, or a tailored MOOC or a private MOOC, it doesn't matter much. It doesn't matter much. The ability of, of the technology to push you in a direction that actually enhances learning, enhances learning. And we're implementing that in our classrooms. Now we hope that the Georgia Tech brand uh, gets widely distributed and that, that our, our professors that we think are superstar teachers get rated highly at Coursera, but that's not the reason that we're doing it. We're doing it because we actually think that it matters for education. And it's not a unanimous opinion. I mean, I run this little tiny center, uh, and I have no administrative role at Georgia Tech. My only role is to kind of throw sand in the gears when I think it's appropriate. Um, and and, and one, of the, one of the things that's happened is we've created a, a debate on campus. Who would have thought this is going to happen? Who would have thought that Georgia Tech, a research university, where, you know, if you read the Princeton Review, 80% of the professors don't care much about the students, um, would all of a sudden be a place where 80% of the faculty is heatedly involved in this debate about what should Georgia Tech look like in the future? What should undergraduate education uh, be like? Maybe we should be thinking um, not in terms of a monolithic uh, uh, core curriculum with very few electives like we have in our mechanical engineering programs, but something more like a hack degree, something more like a degree that allows students to put together smaller components so that they can get a broader, um, a broader experience. So this debate, I don't think, would happen in the absence of the, of the technology. So what's, what's going on here? I, I, I've given you, I, I think, kind of a, a roundabout description of, of what's happening um, in, in higher education. Uh, and whether or not you see all the dimensions of it at a place like Dartmouth, you can step back, you can read um, on a daily basis Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Education, and get a sense of what is the problem that is consuming um, presidents at most of the other universities around the country. Um, if you're a public institution, state investment is going down. Michael Crow, president of, of Arizona State, has this beautiful graph that shows the year, state by state, the year at which public institutions are supported at 0% by their states. Like Arizona is due to, to cross the 0% the threshold uh, in 2017. Um, Arkansas, unbelievably, will never cross it. So there's less money, but the number of students keeps going up. Public universities have to decide what to do about that. Private universities um, uh, are, are clustered around the few 
highly desirable universities that can afford to be selective, that can afford to handpick their freshman classes. And I think there's something to this. If you can handpick your class, your entering, your entering class, you can guarantee the outcome. I would bet, barring death or disease, you know what's going to happen to every entering freshman at Dartmouth. And I would bet that Princeton knows the outcome for every entering freshman. That's a very different environment than the next tier of private universities and the vast bulk of public universities. We can argue about why this is happening, whether it's political, whether, it, whether it's, it, it's, it's economics, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it doesn't really matter much. The second thing that's happening uh, is that um, we hit the financial wall in 2008. And um, student debt started to rise. Uh, the number of jobs available um, fell. Uh, and so defaults on loans started to go, to go up. I'm sure you all know that student debt, um, when you take away mortgage debt, uh, is the single largest source of indebtedness for, for American families. Depending on how you count it, a trillion dollars or more in, um, in student debt. Um, the job picture has been, has been dismal for, for most Americans for a long time. Um, it wasn't great for college graduates. It's hard to repay a debt when you don't have a regular paycheck coming in. Uh, and, so, and so default rates went up. Not helped by the fact that there were a bunch of for-profit institutions out there um, that, that were very good at taking students in, not so great at developing skills in those students that would be um, valuable in the marketplace. By the way, it, it's, it's, it, it's easy to look at the for-profits. It's easy to look at, at the University of Phoenix and say, well, you know, they, that's a different class of, of institution and a different class of student. But I see it in my system. Uh, I see the completion rate, the 32% completion rate for the University of Georgia system and cringe um, because I know that those students are coming into a lecture environment like this. Um, they're not being given individualized attention. Uh, and the universities are being penalized for each one of those students that gets into that environment and says, this isn't for me. And that story is replicated many, many times around the country. Of course, the other thing that's happening um, is that, as you know, because he was here, people like Sal Khan uh, started throwing water balloons from outside higher education and said, you know what, there's a different way of doing this. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try flipping a classroom? Why don't you try, um, uh, instead of hour-long lectures, why don't you try short, punchy pieces of information followed by rigorous assessment? And then Daphne came along, and Sebastian Thrun came along, and Anant Agarwal, Raphael Reif came along, and said, you know what, we can do this too with our institutions, and that's where this great experiment started. So here's what this means. Here's what this means. We, we, we got where we are as institutions of higher education by being gatekeepers. If you wanted a degree in the US, you had to come to us. And we got to call the shots. We got to say who got in, who got out. You didn't have a choice. But now there are choices. A bypass economy has built up around higher education. And whether or not you like it, students no longer look at us, at least my institution, as a gatekeeper. We still get a lot of applications, and we can afford to be very selective. But I can tell you that, that the students that we don't admit are going to find a bypass to Georgia Tech. Yeah. It may be 
a future degree offered by Coursera. Um, it may be something that we haven't invented yet, but this bypass economy is something that we know about. This has happened, this has happened many, many times um, in, in, the, um, in the history of the, of the Internet, in the brief history of the Internet, in which an existing institution, an incumbent institution, has said, we are the gatekeepers. We, we newspapers, we local newspapers, um, hold the, the keys to classified advertising. If you want to sell your car in Hanover, New Hampshire, you have to come to us because we will publish your ad for your car. We'll tell the potential buyer where the car can be seen. We will mediate this process. And that's such a valuable thing that we can afford to charge an exorbitant amount of money for it. In fact, we can charge so much money that we fund the operation of the rest of the newspaper. I know this because when I was at Belcor, um, we tried to sell um, uh, an online version of this to some newspapers, and, and the local newspapers said, you're crazy. Who would buy a car never having seen the car? And then Craigslist came along and drove the profitability out of classified ads. The profitability of classified ads drove profitability out of local newspapers. They had to raise regular ad rates. They had to increase subscription rates. And one by one, those local newspapers went out of business. The same kind of process I was mentioning a few minutes ago for universities that are going to go out of business because they didn't recognize a bypass economy. They said, like some of my colleagues have said, why should we give away this stuff that we used to charge for? You know, I've heard local newspaper editors say that. I've heard my friends across Fifth Street in Atlanta say it. Why should we give away courses that we used to be able to charge for? And the answer, of course, is it doesn't matter whether or not we give them away. Someone will. Some Craigslist will come along and do for the people that want those courses what we're unwilling to do. And they may do it well enough. They may have enough innovation so that we become irrelevant. If you will, the profitability gets shipped out of, shifted out of, um, uh, out of higher education. So this, this, this transformation process that, that, that you see in, in electrification, in railroads, in newspapers, in bookstores, is now coming to roost for us. And we have to deal with it. And that's, that's where the system of excellence comes in. We don't have a way of dealing with it. How do we fund students that want to go to Valdosta State University in South Georgia. We fund them through either Pell Grants or Title IV loans. How do they get those loans? The federal government looks at, at a description of what you do and who you are and says that if you enroll at this institution, I will give you the loan, I will give you the grant. The accrediting agencies are the people that now stand in the way of students entering our institutions. But if you're giving courses away, does it matter? Does it matter whether the accrediting agencies have said, we're going to approve this institution or not approve this, this institution? That's a question that's playing out right now. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, um, just a few weeks ago, the Department of Education put out a statement saying that they were going to allow for the first time the accreditation of courses offered in this MOOC format. That's a very big deal. That's a very big deal. And you have accrediting institutions around the country trying to figure out what this means. because. If, you not, if you're not measuring the percentage of professors that actually keep office hours and the size of, 
of, of libraries um, and all the things that accreditors do that they advertise as, as quality um, uh, assessment for their institutions, why do they need to exist? Won't something else replace them? I know accreditation is probably the last thing you want to think about late on a Tuesday afternoon, but it is frankly speaking the most exciting thing going on in higher education now. And it's driven by this kind of transformation that I was talking about at the outset. Thinking about learning in a different way. When you think about learning in a different way, you look at the, you look at the, um, uh, at the, at the bureaucracies that are essentially 19th century incarnations of what Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller thought mattered in a factory and got impressed on universities. That may all disappear. We don't know what it's going to be replaced with yet. But it will certainly disappear. So let me, let me close my, my remarks and, and, and take questions by, um, by, by posing just a, a couple ideas to you. One is, is um, a reflection of what I hear in talking to faculty colleagues. Um, and, and that's that there's a false choice that's being presented to professors. If you read the comments section in the New York Times, every time the word MOOC appears, there are 300 comments from the same people that said, you can't replace a residential college with an online, massively open online course. And that's certainly true. That's certainly true. If that's what, what, what was being proposed, then we wouldn't be having a very interesting discussion. But what's being proposed is something different. Um, what's being proposed actually hasn't taken form yet. What's being proposed is what Moody's called for. What's being proposed, I think, is a structural change in the way universities operate. I thought about making a PowerPoint slide for this, for this last, last point, and I, and, I, and I didn't, so I'll have to describe it to you. But if you, if you think about how we organize this institution, other institutions, it's a single professor, maybe a teaching assistant, impacting maybe 300 students at one time. If it's a big lecture, 300 students at one time. So professor, TA, 300 students, an assessment process off to the side. If, in fact, we take the two sigma problem seriously, we wouldn't organize that way. We would have a professor leading a team. And that team would consist of instructional designers, of production, creative production people, um, advisors. In urban areas, family counselors, because, because you've got to get students out of, out of families that, that have never thought of higher education into higher education. Maybe, maybe a team of seven, eight, nine people supporting the professor. But what's happening is that the flow has been reversed. You don't have a professor reaching out to an audience like this of 300 people. You have 300,000 people flowing into this process led by a professor. And the only way that you make it through that process is by satisfying an assessment that, that has a definite outcome associated with it. Am I saying that all, all courses, all universities will be structured that way? No. But it is a fundamental restructuring. If you wanted to know what might a university look like in the future, it might look less like Georgia Tech looks today and more like MD Anderson Center in Houston, in which patients are met with a team of people who are focused on their, on their needs. And, and the structure of the team is scalable so that you can get 10, 100, 1,000 time fold improvement in the number of people that you can, that you can treat with a, definite, with a definite outcome. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, what it means, of course, is that you don't need as many professors. At least you don't need as many professors doing that, doing that, 
that job. If we looked seriously at the number of students in our residential programs that can be handled in the MOOC format, the wraparound MOOC format at Georgia Tech, it's probably a quarter of the faculty. We can handle our load, 10 times our load, with a quarter of the faculty. We need more of these other people, a quarter of the faculty. Well, that's a savings. What would you do with that savings? Some people would say, well, you cut your prices. You don't have that money to spend on, on, on professors. I think that's exactly the wrong message to carry away from that. I think what you do is you use that savings to do what Carl Wayman says matters. To get the individualized attention, to get the individualized interaction with students. To invest in scholarship, for example, as opposed to sponsored research. And I know there's been a discussion in your, in your strategic planning sessions about the role of sponsored research on, on, this, on this campus. I make the point in my book that, that there's a difference between scholarship and sponsored research. Universities that don't support scholarship on the part of their faculty are doing a disservice to their students and are probably not going to, going to survive. But that does not mean that every institution in the U.S. should all of a sudden be pursuing NIH and NSF. Grants. But you can take efficiencies in the part of the curriculum where you can guarantee an outcome if you do it right and reapply that to other parts of the institution, scholarship being one of them. We think, for example, that by distributing uh, MOOCs for the general ed requirements at a place like Georgia Tech, just to Georgia high schools, we can increase the number of applicants to our engineering programs by a factor of 10. And that in that factor of 10, we'll be able to find students that we would have selected had we known what they could do as freshmen and admit them as juniors. So maybe two or three times as many juniors in our junior class as we have today. Where do we get the money for that? We get it from savings in the front end of the, the, front end of the process. We get it from allowing a kind of flexibility in our programs that we don't have, that we don't have today. So I want to come back just as a closing, closing comment to, to the title of my book. Because um, I've, I've taken you on a, on a, on a tour of, of, of ideas. I, I, th I think the the thing that I'd like you to carry away um, is that the history of higher education in the West has been a historic arc from Peter Abelard to, I said Apple, that's because I wrote the book in 2008 and Coursera didn't exist and I thought Apple and Abelard were nicely alliterative and <laughs> made a good title. Um, but Peter Abelard to Coursera, to Udacity, to edX, to iTunes, to iTunes U. And what's the common denominator in that historical arc? The common denominator is that the institutions, the underlying institutions, play a secondary role. Peter Abelard, after all, didn't have a university. He attracted students by the thousands simply by the force of his personality and, and I understand good looks. Um, and to, to, listen, to listen to him tweak the nose of, of, of ecclesiastical hierarchy. He didn't need an institution to do that. Coursera doesn't need an institution to attract millions of students to premium quality courses. Now, does that mean that the institutions are going to disappear? Maybe some of them will. Which ones won't? The ones that have a value proposition that they can offer to students that distinguishes them from their peers. The title of my book, Abelard to Apple, is about the value of the professor, the value of teaching, the value of learning in higher education, and how difficult it is for institutions to keep up with that. We're living in an age where institutions are trying, running really hard in place to, to do it. Not all of them will succeed. Subtitle of the book is The Fate 
of American colleges and universities. Reviewers have marked, remarked about the word fate in the, in the title. Do I mean that we're doomed? No, I mean, I mean that we as institutions are subject to the same social, economic, political forces as any other human enterprise. That's our fate. And when we ignore that, we ignore it at our peril. The exciting thing for me, and, and, and the really unexpected thing for me um, at this point in my career is to find myself in a place where there's a global laboratory that tests these ideas. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited um, sort of beyond um, my, um, my jaded years as a, as a research professor uh, in, in the possibilities of what's going on in, in higher education. Uh, I would like to see um, a place like Dartmouth participate um, in that. And um, I know that your, your strategic plan is making you focus on, on the role of undergraduate education and what it means in the future. And, and you'll be part of this discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you.